here's Ed Bernstein. Do you know we have a new UNLV president? Well, he's with me now, Len Jessup. Welcome to uh, Las Vegas. Welcome to the university. You know, UNLV, and we were just talking, is, I feel, is kind of on the cusp of greatness. Um, well, you, I believe you that as well. And, and you, you, you're, you're kind of transferred, for lack of a better word, re rehired from uh, right. University of Arizona. Right. What, now, University of Arizona kind of, uh, you know, has a more established school than UNLV. So when you're looking at moving, what were some of the considerations that you can took, in, took, in, took into mind? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, exactly what you just said, and it's the, the big attraction to coming over here was exactly and, and precisely because of the great opportunity here that uh, UNLV has. Um, I've often said here uh, in the last couple of months that I've been here on the job uh, to folks that this is, a, this is a great time for this university, right? Great, great opportunity for this university in this place at this time. It's poised to make the jump up into the next echelon of universities, uh, the, the t you know, the top level of universities. And I just, I wanted to come over and be a part of that. And, you know, that's been evidenced by what the, the law school has done, for instance. Yes. Um, UNLV has always been known as you know, hotel, restaurant, you know, uh, those kind of uh, majors. But then the law school came in, created a, uh, you know, uh, um, a new law school from scratch, right. you know, with really not even a facility. And has become one of the you know most significant uh, what, what top one top 50 top 100 law yeah. schools in the country. No, absolutely. In fact, to your point, uh, U.S. News just ranked all law schools and other kinds of graduate programs mm -hmm. around the country just a few weeks ago, and, and the Boyd School jumped 16 spots in one year in U.S. News and World Report. That's phenomenal. I mean, that does not happen right. very often. Right. And, and and I know that you know one of your you know missions is to work with uh, creating a medical school and similarly become, you know, accredited and have the, you know, the kind of acknowledgement that the law school has gotten. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, it, and the Boyd School of Law is a good example, I think, of the track record at UNLV of, of being entrepreneurial and launching new schools with quality and that have great impact. And that's what we plan to do with the medical school as well. As you know, you know, we're short thousands of doctors in this community. And when you get into, we, we have great doctors, we just don't have enough of them. And when you get into uh, serious problems with your health, and you need a high-end specialist. We have them in town, there just aren't enough of them. And so peop people will frequently have to get on the plane and go to another community for their care because there just aren't enough uh, uh, doctors in the, in the specialties. And the medical school will solve that, both for general practitioners and for high-end specialty care. Mm -hmm. Now when you look at the quality of medical care in other cities, I mean, there's a, a direct proportion between, um, connection between um, those cities that have um, schools that right. graduate, that have medical schools, and where the doctors stay in the community and continue to teach, right? Right. No, absolutely. These medical schools build a kind of an ecosystem around there, a healthcare ecosystem, and it's all built around these public medical schools uh, in cities all across the country, and that's the plan here as well. In fact, the evidence shows that if you bring in uh, students into medical school, and if they go through medical school and through all their clinical rotations and their residencies, and they do that all in a community, they become embedded in the community, and the research shows that in those situations, 80% of those students stick. They stay in the community where they've been mm -hmm. trained, and so we certainly need that to happen here. Great, and what you're really talking about is that it's a, a partnership between the, uh, the medical school and the hospitals because the students, when they graduate, need a place to do their internships. Need, and, need, and once they're doing an internship in a certain city, they tend to stay there. Um, and in the past, we really haven't had that with the hospitals. So what are right. we doing to create that partnership with the, with the hospitals? Well, you know, one of the things I really like about what Barbara Atkinson is doing, and she's our planning dean for the medical school and has been doing all the work for this, that she's been working really hard in building that clinical network. I mean, those relationships are already built in a sense. And, and so there are already plans for our new medical school to work with all these hospitals and clinics all around the, the region. It really will put students out clinically out embedded within the entire Clark County, everything out in Henderson and in North Las Vegas and in, uh, in downtown Las Vegas and in each of the hospitals. It's really a beautiful model of partnership. And, and how does that work? Because we have, uh, there's a Toro University in town yeah. and there's another um, Rosemont, medical, yeah. Rose, what is it, Rosemont? Rosemont, yeah. Rosemont, um, is, is that already in, in 
There are, yeah, so there are two privates, or? one kind of being yeah. launched and one, you know, already existing and, uh, I mean, in, in sort of different uh, uh, points in their evolutions. And they're both great private medical schools. We're talking about a public medical school that we'll be launching. We need them all. I mean, the fact of the matter is we need all three of those plus the University of Nevada, Reno Medical School to continue to grow mm -hmm. and to thrive. The state needs all four of them and we still won't have enough doctors. Uh, you know, and so this is a situation where we, we need all of these medical schools to thrive. How large of a medical school are we looking at as far as uh, number of students? Yeah, we're looking mm -hmm. at the first cohort of 60 students uh, coming in, and mm -hmm. then those cohort, cohort sizes will grow, and so that, you know, when we get to a steady state at any one point in time, there'll be several hundred medical s you know, students in the medical school. And what I, what I will say is our ambition, uh, our goal for this first 60 students is we would like to have them all scholarshiped. We're in the, uh, we've just begun um, a drive to raise money for each of those students, uh, so each one of them, and that, that, that initial cohort is fully scholarshiped on the way in the door. Uh, we've got about 15 of those uh, raised so far. Yeah. How much does a medical school education uh, require? It's actually, uh, compared to sort of national standards, it'll be relatively inexpensive for the students in this program. We're working really hard to keep the tuition mm -hmm. down to these students. They'll end up paying about 25000 a year, and so they'll need 25000 for four years, so 100000 over the first four years. And like I said, we've got about 15 of those pledged and paid for, and we, our, our goal is to have all 60 of those students paid for. We're asking the state to step in uh, and give us the, the operating dollars to hire doctors and to run the medical school, and then we'll also be going out to fundraise for the buildings. Uh, so this, mm -hmm. it will be a, a, a true kind of statewide community partnership and just in terms of the business model underlying this, this medical school as well. Yeah, it seems like a difficult task. Uh, you became UNLV president and you get thrown into a legislative session with essentially has you know, major financial issues, and here you are you know, trying to get money for the university. That, that's challenging. It, you know, it is a challenge, but it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's like the old saying, right? We do these things because they're, they're difficult, they're, they're important, and they're difficult mm -hmm. to do. But I will say that well, I got here in the first week of January, and then literally within a matter of days of my arriving, I uh, went up for my first trip to Carson City. Uh, it was for the governor's state of the state. And I have to tell you, uh, sitting there listening to, the, to Brian's state of the state address, I was proud to be a new citizen of this state. He laid out a very ambitious plan for the state huge investments into the future of the state in education, K through 12 and in higher ed and a number of other things, all resting on, I think, a, a bold but very much needed revenue package for this state. And we're, we're all very much in, in support of that. I think it's a great investment in the state and where it goes. So I look at it as, I, I think this is a great time to be here in the state of Nevada right now. I think we're on the brink of doing great things. And, and I hope so. I've been here almost 40 years and for 40 years, every year, you know, I've been hearing this about right. ed money for education. We need better schools, we need better universities, and, and it seems like the politics always get in the middle. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm hoping that, that th I, this year is different. I've been back up several times yeah. to Carson City and, and my team and the, and the UNR team has been doing the same thing, work and, and, our, and our counterparts in the Nevada State Higher Education Office. Mm -hmm. Regents and the Chancellor, all of us up in Carson City working really hard with the legislators on yeah. getting this done, and I feel pretty optimistic. I think we're going to do it. You know, one of the things that the former governor did was create this Millennium Scholarship. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with that yet, yeah. um, but, you know, provided for um, uh, scholarships for all Nevada students that has certain grade point averages and did well in school. And now I hear that we're running out of money with the Millennium Scholarship. It was funded originally from the tobacco settlement uh, right. a number of years ago. It's a, yeah. it's a tremendous opportunity for, for uh, uh, students in the state to be able to go to their, their uh, hometown institutions. I, you know, I, again, I believe, I think we're going to find a way through this legislature, uh, this legislature to find the funding to continue that, and I think we should. That's a tremendous opportunity. You're talking to a kid that was the first in my family to go to college in, in uh, Northern California, and uh, without programs like that, you know, the scholarship program here, I wouldn't have been able to go. Uh, mm -hmm. So I can I can attest to the fact that it's an important program. Yeah, an important program. I mean, you you use that uh, this, this, uh, um, that process to to help you get into school as well as being an awesome uh, center field, right? I understand, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I don't know about the awesome yeah. part, uh, but yeah, my uh -huh. first couple of years in Northern California were at a junior college, and I went primarily to play baseball, um, and was and and got put in center field. I, I think I was probably more uh, a utility player than anything else. I was. Uh, helping as best I could on the field, and I was helping in the dugout as well. I was tutoring and, and helping kids with assignments on my team and anything else I could do to help the team to succeed. Uh, I discovered in the course of those two years that I was uh, really good in the classroom and that I w that was probably going to be it for me in terms of uh, baseball. 
Uh, and so I, I enjoyed every minute of that time on the field. Mm -hmm. I knew it would be my last, uh, and then really got into to school and college. But, but you must have been fast because center field, center, center, center fielders so have a lot of ground to cover, to cover, right? Ground, yeah, exactly. you got to be quick, right? Exactly. <laughs> How important is athletics to uh, to the university? It's it's very important uh, on so many levels, uh, at a, and especially at a university like UNLV and in a community like this. Mm -hmm. I think the, the first the first way that it's important is for the for the student athletes that participate in athletics. In any given year, we'll have several hundred students that are participating in athletics, and it's a great learning and leadership experience for them. It's also a great experience for the rest of us uh, on campus and off campus, the faculty and staff and students and our alum and the community members. It's the way that many of us, and for some people outside the university, it's the primary way that they engage with the university and they interact with the university. So it's a, it's a very enriching experience for everybody. And then the final thing uh, is that, and I've often said this about our program, it's, uh, I look at athletics like it's the window through which people see the university. And we want to be performing well, so they've got a reason to be looking through the window and, 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 and wanting to see what we're doing. But the window's got to be squeaky clean, uh, right? So that it, it, it doesn't uh, in any way uh, tarnish the brand of the university, but it's also a way to really enhance the brand of the university. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, as we talked about with, with uh, the Tarkanian Memorial that we did uh, just a month or so back, um, you know, in, in many ways, he, what he did, the success of the basketball program, really mm -hmm. established UNLV as a national brand. It made people aware of the university here in Las Vegas in, in, in very positive ways. Why, why is money such a big issue with um, the brand, as, as you call it? Uh, th there's a lot of stories um, currently going on in national news magazines about um, almost advocating that uh, student athletes get paid some sort of minimum wage or something. Like if you have a, a part-time job, if you UNLV, you have a part-time right. job, you're at McDonald's, you're going to make minimum wage and, you know, and earn some money. When I look at some of these athletes, um, some of them train in a place where I train. I just, it's right. amazing to me the hours and hours and hours of training right. that they do. And sometimes they're, they're coming from homes where, um, you know, there's a single parent home with, uh, you know, having trouble paying the rent. Right. So um, how do you feel about, you know, these student athletes, at least, I mean, not, not giving them, you know, contracts of millions of right. dollars, but at least paying them some minimum wage? It's, you know, I, I understand both sides of that issue, and it's a really difficult and important one. Uh, first thing I would say is, uh, you know, having been there before as an athlete, at least at the junior college level, uh, that these athletes are spending a lot of time. It's like they've got two full-time jobs, the full-time job of being a student and the full-time job of being an athlete at that level of competition. It's, it's pretty demanding. The, the argument around the country has been that, and it's based on the perception that, that universities are generating a lot of revenue uh, through, uh, through athletics, and so the students ought to somehow benefit in that. And that's the, at the heart of the O'Bannon lawsuit, is that uh, there are uh, games that we play on the Xbox and the PlayStation that have the likeness of those players uh, and that the students want to be able to benefit from their likeness being used. Yeah, you know, that I, I understand. I mean, I understand the, from a business point of view the, the, the validity of that argument. The reality is on these programs, though, people, the perception is that um, among these power conferences, that there are these, these schools that generate a lot of revenue and very profitable. We just had a couple of NCAA consultants come in uh, to the, to, for all the presidents and the chancellor and the regents and to, and to talk about these issues. And we learned many interesting things that day. And one of the things we learned is that nationally, there are only about 18 athletics programs that are actually profitable, right? Uh, and so it's a bit of a, a fallacy thinking that, the that there's a lot of money ge being generated that, uh, with ample profits going around these universities. That's just not the case. Uh, like our museums and our Rose Garden and our Performing Arts Center, I mean, these are all things that, that we pay for. They're enriching to the campus. Uh, they don't pay for themselves, and athletics typically doesn't completely pay for itself either. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a difficult issue. Hey, if we get a professional hockey team, is UNLV <laughs> then get a hockey? Do we have a hockey team at UNLV? I don't even know. Well, uh, I, I, I don't yeah. believe that we do. Uh, we may have yeah. some, um, some uh, kids that play it for fun uh, uh -huh. in field hockey <laughs> and right. in other forms. So do you see that coming if we get a professional uh, hockey team? I'm hearing good things about yeah. The, yeah, the chances of the, uh, the professional hockey team in town. Yeah, we'll be there. We love, Christy and I both love sports, so mm -hmm. we'll certainly be there. Mm -hmm. I have uh, two, uh, two daughters going to UNLV currently. They complain to me all the time about parking. Are we doing anything about the parking problem? We are. There? Uh, yeah. There's a very good uh, campus master plan that's in place and several things planned that will address you know, to address the parking problem. And the most immediate will be a parking garage that's going to go uh, in right across the uh, Maryland 
Parkway from the administration mm -hmm. building. So, yeah, I, I understand. I understand. I've toured the campus now several times, and I've seen it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an acute problem. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, but we do have the ground, and we're and building a garage. <laughs> that, yes. that's, that's terrific. Exactly. Some colleges um, and universities around the country are having a difficulty uh, tackling this issue with um, fraternities, sororities, date rapes, that type of thing. Is that, has that been an issue on the UNLV campus? Well, we, we've had our issues as, uh, just like uh, other campuses have around the country, not, not to the extent that some other universities are, are dealing with this problem, uh, f fortunately. Um, you know, what I've seen in my experience at universities I've been at, and I've been at some pretty good universities with a pretty deep Greek culture, University of Arizona, Washington State University, Indiana University are examples, but they've got a really, a, a very thick and productive uh, kind of Greek culture. And when it's worked, it's, it's w the situations I've seen that have worked have been where there's a partnership between the, the fraternity or sorority and the campus and the alumni of the fraternity. Probably the best example of that is at Washington State University where uh, Paul Allen, one of the co-founders of Microsoft, and other alum from his fraternity mm -hmm. stepped in in partnership with the university and the, and the students in the fraternity to really reinvent that fraternity. Uh, and uh, so it's partnership, you know, situations like that that really make Greek life work yeah. the way it's supposed to work. Right. And of course, when there are problems, it filters through a, um, a due process procedure at the university, which is and other schools have been criticized about uh, they, they seem to you know be uh, um, biased toward uh, away from the, the female that's complaining. Um, so I, I don't know. Is this does each university have their own set of rules on how they handle that, or, or and, and how does the UNL, UNLV rules uh, stack up? And I apologize. I know you're just new in this job. Yeah. I don't even know if you're dealt with this issue yet yeah uh, you know from my conversations with our teams in, mm -hmm. in, in, in student life and, and from the and from our uh, attorneys on campus uh, I feel like we've got a, a, a good process on campus and there, there aren't any biases one way or another uh, when people come in to, uh, or, or go to our campus police uh, with complaints of uh, you know situations that we that they've been in it's something that the, you know we're very uh, acutely aware of and are on top of, uh, and making sure that we you know, provide a safe environment uh, for students. And knock on wood, there have been a relatively low uh, inc uh, you know, um, uh, incidence, uh, you know, things like that. So that's been good. You've come from uh, schools where there's a lot of um, resident students you know, living on campus. Yeah. UNLV is known for not so much to have uh, you know yeah. the, the majority uh, of people living on, on campus yeah. like some of these other schools. Uh, what kind of challenge does that create for you? It, you know, it, it, it doesn't really. We've got, we have a lot of part-time students and we have a lot of full-time students now. Actually, I think people would be surprised at how many students live on campus now. Uh, several thousand living on campus. Um, and they're just two different learner populations and they're neither, neither one is good or bad. Uh, they're just uh, different sets of learners with different needs and we embrace uh, both of them. Uh, we want to be the place. Uh, that's a good place to go if you're working full-time uh, and you need to be able to uh, have access mm -hmm. to a degree program in a convenient way. But we also want to be the place that provides a great campus experience for full-time students. We're um, in the process of uh, uh, doing some things to, to make our on-campus and near-campus housing better because we're finding actually that we're growing in the full-time student population, uh, which is interesting, right? That's kind of counter to the mm -hmm. history of the university. Right, so. I, guess, I guess the more attractive you make dormitories, the more you, you, you'll fill them up quicker. No, absolutely, right? and, yeah. and we've actually, in, within the last uh, several years at UNLV, we've brought in an outside group to run all the dormitories for us, and they're doing a fantastic job. They do a better job. It's outsourcing, right? We've, right? They do a better yeah. job of it than we do. They're running all of our on-campus dormitories. Uh, they're at capacity. They're full. We need more. Uh, we're about to uh, embark on the same kind of a partnership with some off-campus housing that's right nearby. We're going to turn it over to an outside group that's about to come in and and essentially redo all of it, make it much more attractive for our students. Uh, so no. it's good. Where, the, where do you see the online world, um, you know, ha and how does it interface yeah. with, uh, with the brick and mortar school? Yeah. We do have online programs on campus. So for example, the, we have a very good uh, graduate program in nursing that's now offered completely online. That was just ranked uh, about a month ago by U U.S. News as the number six program in the country. It's a very good program. Uh, the, the future is in online. Uh, I've been around it enough now at all the universities I just mentioned uh, to, and, and having built really successful high quality online programs both at Indiana and at Washington State and then at University of Arizona. 
And I've done enough of it to know that you can do it with quality. You can, in fact, at Arizona, we just built two gra graduate level degree programs that are fully accredited, our same faculty, same curriculum, we just do it online. Uh, they're both highly ranked now. It's a high quality experience. Um, I urge students, if they can, to be in our, you know, back at Arizona, to be in the on-campus, you know, uh, counterparts to those programs, if they can. But a lot of students can't. They're, they're just too busy. Uh, they're either working full time mm -hmm. or they've got kids that, that they're trying to raise and everything else, maybe taking care of parents. Uh, they just can't take out the time to even do a, a, like a nighttime program on campus. And so the online program is really the only answer for them. And so we want to provide that kind of access for them. So I think uh, uh, that the, uh, it, we're headed that way because that's what students demand, especially as uh, we've got you know, folks in the baby boom generation that are older and at a point where they'd like to have access to a degree, but they just, they just can't fit it into their lives right now. We want to help with that. Is attendance in college um, expanding or decreasing? It's uh, it, across the country, it continues to grow. Uh -huh. uh, and at UNLV, it continues to grow, and it's grown each year. We're now a little bit north of 28,000 students. And we've got demand for more. Uh, if we could open the doors and, and uh, open up some classrooms, we could, we could bring in more students. And that's our plan to do that. We'd like to grow and to be able to provide access. Mm -hmm. There's clearly demand for it in this community. We're a city of 2 million uh, and relatively underserved uh, with uh, university. And, and what are the popular majors now for somebody entering school? Well, the interesting this will sound like a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm biased, but uh, that, that, that there's actually data that tracks all across the country uh, by Princeton Review and a number of other organizations that track what are the most popular majors, what are students asking for, and what majors are they getting into. And uh, over the last several years, the most popular major across the country is business. It's the discipline that I just came from. And that's been driven by the downturn, by the economic downturn. Students were focusing and moving into business degrees as a way to make sure that they got a, a job opportunity. Uh, now as we're coming out of the downturn, uh, you know, the, and, and companies are hiring again, uh, you, can, you can get a job and you don't necessarily have to have a degree in, in accounting or in marketing, but that's certainly a very popular degree nationally. With all these students moving into business, does that impact um, your ability to hire teachers because they're not moving into education? Yeah, it does in all the areas. I mean, so uh, you know, at UNLV, we've got great programs all across the campus, all the way from engineering to the sciences and to business and in arts and humanities and, and, and building specifically now in the health sciences. And that challenge exists for all of those disciplines. Uh, we've got demand uh, uh, from students to get into all those programs at UNLV. And the challenge for all those disciplines is now hiring faculty, finding mm -hmm. faculty. It is a, it is a challenge, finding so, you know, kind of qualified, doctorally qualified mm -hmm. faculty. So how do you do hire. that? What, what's, what's the process in finding uh, qualified educators? It's, uh, it's you know, one where you've got to be really aggressive and entrepreneurial in the hiring. And so in each of our disciplines, we have faculty that will go to whatever their national meeting is, and they're selling. Uh, you know, they're out aggressively promoting mm -hmm. the university and, 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 and interviewing and prospecting, in a sense, for faculty at those national meetings, and it begins there. And, you know, I think it also begins with the, and is, uh, and certainly helped by what we're doing and moving the university up to top tier status. Uh, by having the university be recognized as being a high quality institution, that helps to pull faculty in. They want to come in, high quality students want to come into our, our programs, and that certainly helps as well. Yeah. How, how difficult is that when you're creating a new program, like a medical school, and you don't really have a history in that area? You know, it's a, it, it is a challenge, and that was one of the primary reasons why we want to scholarship the, 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 the 60 students that come in for the first cohort. And there are two reasons. And one of it is that those students are, are entering into an unaccredited medical school. It, it's a risk for them, in a sense. And so, okay, you can explain what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, so each of the medical schools ultimately gets accredi accredited by the LCME, is the, the body uh, liaison committee for medical education that does the accrediting. But it happens and later it, on. I mean, there right. has to be a history right. in order to get accredited, and, so you have to be in school and, and complying, right? Yeah, and so yeah. the accreditation process has already begun. We've already, we're in contact with the LCME. They've already assigned an, a, a, an accrediting committee for our mm -hmm. campus. We're getting our self-study ready. That, that's all in the works. So they'll look at the quality of the faculty that we start with, the, the planning dean and the faculty, the quality of the curriculum we propose, and then they really look hard at that first cohort of 60 students. That's a big part of the accreditation. So you've got to, you're in a bind because the students are taking a risk on you. You're not yet accredited, but yet the accreditation is based on the quality of the 60 students. And what we found is a best practice with the launch of new medical schools around the country is, is to scholarship the first group to make sure that you've recruited the best possible you know, first mm -hmm. set of students that you can nationally. And we will, with scholarships, we'll be able to attract the best of the best from in-state and out.
So the plan is to, um, to uh, I guess you have four years in order to uh, achieve the accreditation, right? right? So, you have, you know, so you have at least a yeah. pathway there. No, absolutely. Yeah. And they look heavily at the quality of that incoming group coming in. And then they look at, is there and then moving mm -hmm. on to their residencies? They look at the quality of the, how they've done on national exams and how they're doing in their residencies. And so it, uh, this, the quality of this first class is really important in many, many ways. And I should point out, this is exactly what happened with the law school. It went through this it's process very similar as process. well. And it was one of the quickest law schools in the country to get accredited. Right, no, exactly. Right. That's what we hope to do with the medical school as well. Well, so um, when, when you, have you hired the medical staff, the teachers yet, the educators? Uh, not quite yet. I mean, that's what we're asking for the, the state for now is the seed capital that essentially you know, enables us to hire the doctors. And think about that. I mean, we're talking about hiring 100 doctors. That's a, an immediate injection of 100 high-quality high doctors into the community just at the beginning of the medical school. So are you able to hire doctors in private practice to come in and teach, uh, you know, certain specialties? Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to have an education degree like, uh, like a typical teacher. No, we'll be hiring yeah. medical doctors from, from all over, in-state and out. All right, so that's very helpful because yeah. you can get somebody who's really um, – private practice that comes oh, in and teaches a class or two. Many in the community, yeah, that are that are waiting and are ready to, to come and to help us with the You're getting a school. good response from yeah, the absolutely. community with that? Absolutely. Several of those scholarships are from doctors in the community that uh -huh. really want this to happen. Yeah, it's been great. We've got a also a community advisory board of 20 or 30 people comprised largely of, of doctors uh, around town. Very supportive of the launch of the medical school. Well, that's terrific. Yeah. Well, welcome to Las Vegas. Hey, thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, UNLV President Len Jessup, uh, and you got a you, you got a lot on your plate, and uh, just throw you right into the job. You know, <laughs> no, so you, you got to have some special talents to to be able to you know come out on the right end of that. Oh, it's fun. Yeah. I love it here. It's great, it, and we we're both loving it here. It's great to be here. This is a great time to be here. Love yeah. it. Stay tuned. We'll have you back once we get this medical school up and running. Sounds good. Okay. Look forward to it. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Time can change many things, but what doesn't change is our commitment to serve you. So if you've been injured in an accident, or if you need help in Social Security or workers' comp case, we can get you the best possible result. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com. Time can change many things, but what doesn't change is our commitment to serve you. So if you've been injured in an accident, or if you need help in Social Security or workers' comp case, we can get you the best possible result. Enough said. Call Ed. EdBernstein.com.